Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to our fourth uh, Ramadan Halakha on our Human Dignity series. As you all know, uh, we've been doing this uh, Human Dignity series during Ramadan, um, and this is our fourth Halakha. Uh, and we've been touching on topics that uh, really get at the core of human dignity, but also in conversation with Islam. So the first uh, halaqa that we did was on gender-based oppression with Sister Ghada uh, Ghazal. And then we also did uh, anti-racism with Dr. Bilal Ansari. We did white supremacy with Dr. Kamila Mumin Rashad. Uh, and today uh, we have two very special guests. Um, so just a little bit background on the uh, the halaqa series in and of itself. Um, so as, as mentioned, this, this halaqa series came out of a uh, conversation with Sister Ghada um, but really putting this, uh, these, these issues that are at the forefront of our society and at the forefront of our uh, just general discourse and putting them in conversation with our faith and putting them in conversation with how um, Islam has a, uh, a perspective or different perspectives on this. And so today we will be covering environmental justice, dignity, and our Islamic duty with uh, sisters Sarah Latif and Corey Majid. And so just a quick read on their bios, and then I'll let them take it away from there. But uh, Sister Corey Majid, so since uh, uh, 2013, uh, Corey has used her Green Ramadan platform to encourage Muslims to eat mindfully and tread lightly by cultivating sustainable habits during Ramadan. Very important. Uh, these habits are based on Islamic teachings and principles that call humanity to give all of Allah's creation their rights. Corey is a Green Faith Fellow, uh, Master Watershed Steward, a Muhammad Ali Scholar, at Bayan Islamic Graduate School and co-chair of the Green Team at Masjid Muhammad, the nation's mosque in Washington, D.C. Corey is also the co-author of the ebook 40 Green Hadith, Sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Environmental Justice and Sustainability. And we'll drop a link to that book. It's, uh, it's really uh, handy and it's just, it's, it's, it's a really great resource that uh, these two ladies have, have, have put together. So um, now with Sister Sara, Sister Latif is a Guyanese American Muslim raised in New Jersey. Her enthusiasm and work focuses on the intersection of sustainability, urban farming, community building, and faith-based education rooted in Islam. Sara has a master's degree in sustainability and leadership from Montclair State University, and she's a part of the Green Faith Fellowship Program as well, and co-authored the same book, um, 40 Green Hadith, um, Sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Sara takes much inspiration from her faith and believes that nature should be used to better know, serve, and worship Allah. And so with that, I will uh, open the floor here. Sara and Corey, please uh, take take it away. And then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, I'll see you back uh, for question and answer, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much. So we're going to start off by doing a quick review of 40 Green Hadith. And I'm going to share my screen real quick, inshallah. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Present. All right. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Sarah? Okay. So I need yeah. to adjust my volume. Okay, yeah. great. All right. So 40 Green Hadith. It's a collection of sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on environmental justice and sustainability. So Sarah and I were Green Faith Fellows a while back. And Green Faith is, well, we're still Green Faith Fellows, but we're in the Green Faith Fellowship Program a while back. And Green Faith is building a worldwide interfaith climate and, and environmental movement. And Sarah and I were part of Green Faith Fellowship Program, which educates people, whether it be priests or imams or lay people of various faiths to create local communities who protect both the people and the planet. And Sara is going to go ahead and tell us why we thought making a book of 40 Green Hadith was necessary. And then we're going to give you a peek inside of 40 Green Hadith. All right, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And as Corey mentioned, we're just going to talk a little bit about the document itself, 40 Green Hadith. So as part of the Green Faith Fellowship Program, we had to do a leadership project. This could have been any format. Um, it could be by yourself with the group. And so Corey and I decided to team up together. 
and to create this compilation of 40 green hadith. And the reason we decided to do this uh, hadith specifically is we were actually looking for a document like this. And I encourage you all, whoever, everyone who's listening, is if you can't find a document or you can't find a resource, you can't find something that you know there's a need for it, why not try and create it yourself? So alhamdulillah, we were able to compile 40 green hadith. And it is a collection of hadith sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pertaining specifically to um, environmentalism and, and justice uh, in itself. And we had often found a lot of collections of Quranic ayats um, about this topic, but we didn't really find a lot of hadith. So we wanted this to be a handy resource tool that can be used for everyone and, and that could have language that is easy to understand whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. So go ahead, Corey. Okay, good. So we wanted to create a book that was downloadable anywhere in the world. So we were working with or, and learning with Green Faith Fellows from, at least, I think at least 10 different countries. So we wanted to have a resource that could be downloadable, whether they were in Zambia or whether they were in Paris, Texas, right? So. And we also want it to be, you know, easy, easily searchable. So we put it in an ebook, ebook format. We included all of our, our sources where we got it from. And uh, we grouped the Hadith into categories based on uh, their creation according to Islamic thought. So we have the, a section, the first section is on water. And then we have earth and plants and animals and livestock. And we wanted to have the, the Arabic alongside with the English translation. And in the Arabic, there's like a, a complete chain of narration, but in English, we, we shorten it just for readability for the, the people who may not understand what you know a chain of narration is. So right here, I'm gonna give you a little, little peek inside of, of what the 40 green hadith look like. And so this is the beginning of the water section. And we start with an inspiring quote, uh, inspiring verse from the Quran about water. And then Sarah here gives uh, a short reflection about water in the Quran and, and, and in, the following, in the following hadith. And then this is what the, the following hadith would look like for each of the sections. So we have the Arabic on the left and on the top right, we have the English translation. And in the bottom right, you have an indicator of what section you're in. So right now we're in this, the water section and it would look different when you were in the animal section or in the plant section. And we also have the, the Hadith number. So we have 40 Hadith and this right here is Hadith number four. So what made this document very unique as well is that we have a discussion and reflection section towards the end of the document. So after you've gone through all the 40 hadiths, you're able to have a set of questions that focus on cultivating conversation and, and hopefully leading towards taking action. So we want it to be a guide for individual groups uh, for an individual or for group settings um, to reflect on the meaning of the hadith, discuss how to apply the context or the spirit of hadith to a specific, you know, situation, time, location, or challenge, um, and then also use it in an interfaith setting or, or a group gathering um, to highlight and examine and really dissect and immerse yourself with these environmental concepts from Islamic framework. So that's a quick overview of 40 Green Hadith, and it's basically been the foundation of probably a lot of our talk uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna give in a, a few moments. And you can download it at tiny.cc slash 40, the number green hadith. And we encourage you to share it, share it with your imam leadership, uh, your masjid leadership, your imams, your chaplains, uh, share it with your youth groups, uh, share it on, on, on Instagram and Facebook and um, make this source available to to everyone. And um, I just want to give um, a little notice that we're currently working on having this hadith translated, uh, sort of an English, not a, a Spanish Arabic translation. So I can't wait 
to get that out to the people. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, Sara is going to work it out. Go ahead, girl. All right. Thank you, Sister Corey. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm very excited and honored to be a part of this Ramadan halakha, inshallah, and on the topic of environmental justice, um, dignity, and our Islamic and our Islamic duty and obligation to take care, taking care of this earth. And I really am grateful for Muslim Space and Chaplain Islamah for having us. Uh, alhamdulillah. And so let's get started. So one of the key aspects of this halakha is dignity. So if you want, feel free to put in the chat, what do you think of when you hear the word dignity? Or, you know, or just think about, you don't have to put in the chat if you don't like to, but just think about what do you think of when you hear the word dignity? Because for me, there is this profound level of nobility and honor, honorary title when I think of someone who's a dignified person as well as a connection to moral ethics. So I decided to look up the word dignitary, dig, look up the word dignity in, in a simple uh, dictionary definition. And the answer that I got was the state or quality of being worthy of honor or respect. So after, yeah, I see some, some, some um, replies uh, in the chat as well. So a level of authenticity, a level of respect, um, and I decided to do a little bit more research and I want to uplift the uh, thoughts of Dr. Hisham Kamali, who is the author of The Dignity of Man, an Islamic Perspective. And he gives us this, he gives us this definition that connotes um, the inviolability of a human person, the recognition of their set of rights and obligations and guarantee of safe conduct by others and including the society and state. And he also highlights, you know, the physical and spiritual nobility of man, God's love to humanity, the sanctity of life, and the necessity for freedom, equality, and accountability. So subhanAllah, there's a lot of different uh, ways to think of the word dignity. But as Muslims, we know that our two primary sources are the Quran and Sunnah, the way Prophet Muhammad lived his life, and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Let's delve into some Quranic verses. I found that, in my opinion, one of the most explicit affirmations of human dignity, also known as karama in, in Islam, is found in the Quranic verse of chapter 17, verse 70. And Allah tells us, we have bestowed dignity on the children of Adam and carried them on the land and sea and provided for them of good things and conferred upon them special favors above the greater part of our creation. SubhanAllah, this dignity, this verse is self-evident um, in its recognition of this inherent dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as just as being humans, just as human beings, you know, without qualifications of any kind. This is for the entire human race. SubhanAllah, there is no qualification, as I said before. And this includes like every member of the human race, including the pious, the sinner, the wealthy, the person who may not have wealth, the Arab, the non-Arab. If you're human, you are, you have this inherent dignity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And Allah reminds us so many times, especially in the Quran, of being human and how he made us a special creation, a creation that's not like any other creation. He reminds us that he created humans in the best of forms and that he ranked humans in spirituality above that of the angels, subhanAllah. And in chapter 38, verse 72, he reminds us and tells us, he, I breathed into him, Adam, of my spirit. SubhanAllah, we have that divine breath in all of human creation. And it's this gift. And humankind was created in the best of form and fashioned by the, the best, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most just, the best fashioner. that could ever be. And I just wanted to highlight that and, and remind us that as humans, we are given this role on earth and that creation that is supposed to take care of the rest of creation is the human being. And what makes the human soul so dignified and noble is the discernment of speech 
and intellect and the ability to know God to, and to grow with that ability. Allah tells us that he taught Adam the names of things. So subhanAllah, we have that ability to grow and to learn and to con um, continuously and consciously make efforts to better ourselves and our community around us. Allah tells us in chapter 49, verse 13, O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you into people and tribes so that you may know one another. Verily, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the one who is the most righteous. Indeed, is, indeed Allah is all-knowing and all-acquainted. So only difference between humans is in our righteousness. And it's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to tell who is more righteous than someone else. It's not based on our race. It's not based on our which tribe or religion, um, which tribe or region we're from, what language we speak. So we're all dignified in being human. And the only difference is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see who is more righteous uh, via taqwa. So as we talk more about the prophetic tradition, I want to highlight Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our most perfect example of a human being and the most dignified person, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his actions and how he was as a person um, uh, speak for themselves and are so, are so evident when we read and we learn about the way he grew up and the way he treated people, and not only people, and creation as well. He spent a lot of time in nature, spending a lot of time in seclusion, surrounding himself with signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the stories of how he would reflect in the caves often. And as a shepherd, he would spend time out in nature. And um, he reminds us that as Muslims, we have this inherent, we have this duty, this obligation and responsibility to take care of the earth and that we should act as Khalifa or guardians and that we are gonna be held accountable on the day of judgment on how and what we did with that role and with that trust. I wanna also talk a little bit about his companion, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And I just wanted to mention what I thought was extremely interesting in terms of his jurisprudence of war rules. So if you're not familiar, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq um, gave us rules of guidance on the battlefield. I just want to share some of these rules with you. And he encouraged his peers, you know, do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies and do not kill women, children, or the elderly folk. Bring no harm to the trees, nor burn them with fire, especially those which are fruitful. Do not destroy inhabited areas. Do not slaughter any of the enemy's sheep, cow, or camel, except for food. Do not burn date palms, nor harm them in any way. So subhanAllah, even in war, there's emphasis on taking care of creation and taking care of the environment. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught those around him to see human dignity in places that they were often not used to seeing. For example, he spent time with widows, orphans, the sick, the needy. He uplifted the voices of the marginalized people. He uplifted the voices of women that during that society and time was not uplifted at all. And he taught us how to take care of creation and led by example. And not only creation in terms of fellow human beings, as I mentioned before, but also when it comes to taking, taking care of animals and the land and environment around him. I'm going to give you two examples of hadiths, and they're um, after I after I read both of them, you'll see there's a contrasting view of it, but also a really important view to distinguish between the barakah and blessing we get when we do good, and also the the um, consequences of our action when we do harm. I'll start with the the consequences of actions ones. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam reminds us. That whoever kills a small bird for no reason, the bird will beseech Allah on the day of resurrection. And it's going to say, oh, Allah, oh, Lord, so-and-so killed me for no reason. And he did not kill me for any beneficial purpose. On a separate note, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminds us that there is no Muslim who plants a tree or sows a field for a human, a bird or animal's eats from it, but that it's rewarded as charity for him. So subhanAllah, a small deed 
as planting a tree or planting a seed, providing any benefit to creation, it's gonna be rewarded as charity for us. So as a role of Khalifa, often this word is, is um, mentioned a lot when talking about sustainability efforts or in talking about taking care of the environment. And it's derived from the Quranic verse. There's several Quranic verses actually, but the one I'm gonna mention is chapter six, um, verse 165, Allah tells us, and it is he, God, who has made you successors upon the earth and has raised some of you above others in degrees of rank that he may try you through what he has given you. Indeed, your Lord is swift in penalty, but indeed he is forgiving and merciful. SubhanAllah, so we are made as Khalifas on earth. We, are, we have this obligatory responsibility to be caretakers of this earth. And we're gonna be held, um, we're gonna be asked about how we use that responsibility. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the heavens and the earth. And we are merely travelers through this, through this dunya. And we don't even know how long we are gonna be on this earth for, but we still have this responsibility to better our environment, to speak out when there are injustices going on and to also take care of creation and take care of our fellow human beings and our planet as our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. And talking about injustices, it's, it can be often overwhelming and also um, a, a bit discouraging and heartbreaking, but it's a necessary important conversation to have because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the perfect balance of earth. However, as humans came and populated, we caused a lot of destruction, um, especially in terms of development of, of this natural earth. And I just wanted to share with you some of these injustices, um, specifically environmental injustices that are happening to, to, to highlight them and so that we can be more aware of this conversation. A study that was um, done by scientists from the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, was published in the American Journal of Public Health. And it talked about how facilities uh, emitting dangerous particulate air pollution, such as soot, disproportionately impacts low-income communities and communities of color and this demonstrates that there is a reprehensible history of economic injustice and environmental racism regarding air pollution that continues in the United States, unfortunately. And there's that embedded historic racism and economic inequality that were huge factors for this, subhanAllah. And a lot of it comes from, as I mentioned before, but there's also a lack of green space as well that's not accessible or easily accessible to many communities. I had the opportunity to intern at a urban farming organization a few years ago. And we were able to work with a lot of communities that were, were considered low income communities in urban areas that there was really not a lot of green space available. We were able to work with the community and build these community gardens um, and also grow food. And what it did was it what it did was it provided a space and a connection for people to be connected to nature and to have access to clean food that was grown locally. Another example of injustices that are happening around the world, um, even to this day, um, is with Palestine in terms of land injustice due to occupation and military interference in the water sources are often contaminated and polluted with heavy metal and chemical contaminations. And even in the West Bank, uh, we know that Israeli military regularly, you know, up, up root olive trees and the illegal colonial settlers routinely set fire to olive and other fruit orchards, uh, thousands and thousands of these trees. When we think about the rainforests as well, a hundred years ago, two thirds of the planet's living organisms lived in tropical rainforests. And today that number has been halved. And this is due to habitat loss. So clearing forests in, you know, causes a ripple effect. And we may not see it on our everyday day-to-day -day scene, but unfortunately the consequences are gonna come down and they can, they're gonna continuously um, cause negative 
effects and unfortunately oftentimes when it's too late to do something about it. I wanted to share with you all the this declaration that was created. Um, it's called Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change. And a bunch of Muslim leaders from the, around the world came together to write it. And I'm gonna read you a short excerpt from it, inshallah. Um, Intelligence and consciousness be behoove as us humans as our faith commands to treat all things with care and with taqwa of their creator. And we should use compassion, rahma, and utmost good, ihsan. We bear in mind the words of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The world is sweet and verdant, and verily Allah has made your stories in it, and he sees how you acquit yourselves. And I encourage you to check out the full declaration, which I'll put in the chat below, but um, you can also write it down if you would like at www.arrcc.org.au forward slash Islamic underscore declaration. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll end on this note with all of this information that we, we are intertwining and weaving together with dignity, environmental justice, and our obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are given dignity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has given us and entrusted us with this role as Khalifa. And that is our job to be stewards of this earth and to take care of the environment and to uphold justice and to speak out when injustices are occurring. And it sometimes can seem overwhelming, but I would encourage us to, um, Think about it on three different levels, right? An individual level, a local level, and a communal level. How can we implement the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah with regard to taking care of creation? And this can be, think about it for you, for every person, when it comes to sustainability and environmental efforts, for every person, it's gonna be different and it's gonna look different. But the important thing is that you're doing something. I would like to encourage you all to take some of these few steps. The first is education and research. Take some time to spend time in nature and also Understand what our deen, what our religion says about taking care of the environment. Understand what our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did for the environment and how he spoke about taking care of the environment. A lot of this can be emphasized from um, the, the hadith collection that we spoke about earlier. But spend time researching and understanding and creating that connection between understanding what the Quran and Sunnah say about taking care of, of the environment and nature. The second is action. We know that our religion is one of action. We can see it in our five pillars, saying shahada, praying our salah. We have faith in God, but we pay zakat, go to hajj, inshallah. But it's one of action, whether it's small, big, whatever it is, pick an action and just and commit to it, inshallah. This can be, this can mean calling your local representative, or it could mean posting about environmentalism or efforts on social media. But pick an action that you are able to do and within your means. And inshallah, you get the reward for it. A third um, activity or something I'd like to suggest to you is charity, whether it's donating your money or your time. But spend time um, giving, because we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when we give, we always receive more. Whether it's donating to a charity or building a well, donating to a charity that already exists that helps the environment, donating to your local masjid and helping to build a green, a green team there. Whatever it is, um, use your, your time and your money wisely because as I said before, and as a reminder, we're all gonna be held accountable for how we use that, how we use the gifts that we were given and how did we use it to better our surroundings and our creation. And the last thing I'll mention before closing is dua. We know the power of dua, especially in these last nights of Ramadan. We are in such a blessed month, alhamdulillah. Take advantage of this dua, take advantage of making dua for our fellow Muslims and people around the world who are being oppressed for the environmental injustices that are continuously going on and for betterment to ourselves, our creation and the planet. May Allah make it easy for us. May Allah accept from us. And Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. So as uh, Chaplain Usama hinted at, I'm from the South too. I was born in Alabama. I didn't spend, I think I spent maybe the first seven years of my life in Alabama, but then my mom decided she wanted to change her life 
and go into the military. So while she was going through training, uh, Air Force boot camp and whatever training she had to do, I was at grandma's house and it was a, a rural place. And I think there was uh, one road, one paved road that went by her house. And then all the other roads were dirt roads. Those were the best dirt roads ever. We used to walk down a barefoot and go to the creeks and stuff like that. <laughs> and pick like wild blackberries. This was like one of the best times of my life. And I, I think it was one of the best times of my life. It's because I was with a woman who, who like her fitra was intact. She, she, had, she had some land, so she would farm. There, there was a horse and there was like lots of fruit trees and um, she would plant sugar cane and corn and peas. And I remember having the best time just sitting around a pot, um, well, a couple of buckets of peas and shelling peas with my, with my cousins and my aunties and cracking jokes. She had chickens. And so this is a woman who would, you know, plant in the spring and summer, and she would, you know, harvest in the fall. And then in the, in the winter, she would quilt from scraps, right? So she would, I would see her at her sewing machine and she would have bags of scraps on each side of her. And she just pick something from here, pick some, something from there. Like she was weaving together a jazz song. And when I was with her, I knew that watermelons and strawberries, those things came in the spring and summer. They didn't, you didn't get watermelons and strawberries in the winter. That didn't happen, right? <laughs> I knew what fruit and what foods were, were in season because that's what I ate because that's what she had. That's what she went to the garden and, and picked out. And that's what we ate. She was a woman who went to sleep when the sun set and when the sun rose, she was off, right? This was a woman, you know, we're coming on, up on Mother's Day and grandmothers have a special place in our hearts, right? This was a woman who, who honored Allah's gifts for every season. This is a woman who, who personified dignity because she honored Allah's gifts. So when I'm thinking of dignity, someone worthy of honor and respect, I, you know, this is one of the people I think of, right? My grandmother. But who, who makes something worthy of honor and respect? I had, to, I had to think about that, not just accept that, okay, this is what people say. I had to do some research and some, some thinking on that. Does dignity come from the complexity of creation? Just because you are, are a more intellectual creation, that means you have more dignity. Does dignity come from the ability to control other creation? But no, Allah is the one who grants dignity. Allah is the one who, like Sarah mentioned, you know, molded Adam and breathe something of its spirit in Adam, you know, that, that spirit, that soul, that is a personification of dignity, right? And then after uh, Allah proportioned Adam and breathed into him, Allah told the angels fall down in prostration. So Allah gave dignity to, to man, to Adam by making him, molding him himself and commanding the angels, angels to bow down and breathing in Adam of his spirit. And what an honor, what an honor that is. And Allah also says that, uh, that Adam has been honored and the children of Adam have been honored by you know, providing them with land and sea and, 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 and all the good things and preferring them over the other creation. That's a, that's a definite preference that Allah, a way that honor, uh, Allah honored the children of Adam, Adam and the children of Adam, right? 
But while we're feeling good about ourselves as being like the best of creation, we think that, but Allah also said that the creation of the heavens and the earth is greater than the creation of mankind. So that just popped our bubble, put us in our place. And another, another way that Allah granted dignity to creation is that he created communities. He created communities for the animals, right? Allah says, uh, there is no creature on the earth or a bird that flies with his wings, except that they are communities like you. The, these are moral communities with rights outside of, outside of humanity, right? The natural world is not a resource, it, but it is a world that has its own integrity, independent of human needs. Why? Because they praise God in their own way, right? There's not a thing that exalts Allah by his praise, but you just don't understand their way of exalting, right? Human dignity, it doesn't come from our, our just being human, right? Or our great potential or, or our capacities or our qualities um, from anything that we do, but it comes from our relationship with our creator, right? And when we're, we're God-centered, we can reorient, it, reorient ourselves to see that uh, it's, it's not the time of the, uh, the Anthropocene. It's always the time of Allah. We are just one element of the, the totality of this amazing world that Allah has magnificently weaved together. SubhanAllah. We are part of and within the environment as uh, M.M. Safet likes to say all the time. So Allah has honored us and honored creation, given us both dignity, right? And a way of maintaining our dignity and upholding the dignity of the environment is being just. Justice allows us to uphold dignity. So I was reading in uh, a, a recent publication, 40, uh, 40 on Justice by uh, Dr. Omar Suleiman, right? So he did a series, uh, a wonderful YouTube video series online, and there's also a book, so alhamdulillah. And he starts off his book with this Hadith Qudsi. It's uh, one of the, you know, the, the top Hadiths, right? narrated by the prophet on behalf of Allah. So in the Hadith, Allah says, O oh, my servants, I have forbidden oppression for myself and have made it forbidden amongst you. So do not oppress one another. So Allah starts off, O oh, my servants. So Allah's addressing, addressing us with love and giving us example of how to address each other, right? How to give advice. And in Oh My Servants, he's also reminding us that, yes, we are his servants. <laughs> Our role is to serve him. And then Allah is telling us that he will not oppress anyone and neither should we. So this is one thing that uh, Dr. Omar Sulman points out. And I think, I think it's amazing. There's, there's only two things that Allah has mandated on himself. The first one, or one of them is that the angels, he and the angels send peace and blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that we should too. And the other thing that he's mandated on himself is that he will not oppress his creation and neither should we. Oppression is the opposite of justice. Oppression is putting something in a place in which it does not belong. And so when I think of that, putting something in a place where it does not belong. I just want you to, to do a, a quick, a quick uh, uh, visual, visualization with me, right? So just think of the most wonderful, amazing, you know, beautiful place in nature, whether it be in, in Texas or whether it be in another country, just this amazing place where everything is 
everything is it's just there's nothing like it right it's just beautiful it just makes you feel happy right so just picture that place in your mind picture the the, the wind the water that may be there the trees whatever it is that makes this place beautiful to you so once you have that place in your mind put an old car tire in it Whoa, that's oppressive, right? <laughs> Putting something in a place where it does not belong, that is oppression. Can you think about, just think of litter being oppression. And Allah does not love the oppressors. Allah does not like, love those who are un unjust. Allah does not love the Dali Moon, the wrongdoers. So, I think from, from those two things, from those two things that Allah mandates on himself, we can see that the essence of Islam is justice. Justice is putting things in their proper place. It's the middle point between excess and scarcity, right? Justice leads to a, a balance in nature and a balance in our souls and a balance in our relationship with other people. Justice restores dignity. Allah gave us and creation dignity. And the way that we can restore this dignity is through justice. So I wanna share a, a quick hadith about stopping in, injustice or oppression. And this is also in 40 green hadith. And in this hadith, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is, is telling his companions, uh, help your brother, whether your brother is an oppressor or he's an oppressed one. And the, the people said, oh, messenger of Allah, I, okay, I understand how to help someone if they're oppressed, but how do you help someone if they're an oppressor? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, by preventing him, from oppressing others. We give dignity to others. We give dignity to creation. We give dignity to ourselves by justice, preventing oppression. Now, uh, we're reading a lot of Quran right now. And I love, one of my favorite things about reading uh, the Quran is all the, the, all the references to nature and natural elements that just that's just one of the things i love about reading the quran and especially you know reading that and then you know seeing it outside reading the quran outside there's oh it's an amazing experience right so allah mentions many 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 natural elements in the quran you think that'd be a sign right if allah mentions natural elements over and over again that's a sign you need to pay attention to and you can just look at the titles that the, some of the titles of different surahs, different chapters of the Quran, Cow, Bakara, Thunder, Arad, Nahl, the Bee, one of my favorites, Spider, Al Ankabut, Star, Al Najm, Al Qamar, Al Fajr, Al Layl, Al Shams, Al Teen, Al Thil, all these things. All these are signs, signposts pointing to their creator. And one of the signs that uh, I like to talk about is water. And, you know, as we're fasting now, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing better than that first sip of water after fasting all day, right? And so when you read in the Quran, uh, uh, when Allah talks about water, uh, Allah says, you know, look at the water that you drink. So b before you break your fast today, just, just think about this. Look at the water. Did you bring it down from the clouds or did we bring it down? If we had will, we could make it bitter. So why are you not grateful for this water? Why are you not grateful? Why didn't you take that just one second and say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Allah could have put the water and, um, uh, someone mentioned in the, I think uh, Chaplain Osama mentioned in uh, in the chat that Austin is having 
you know, issues with water. And as more people move to the area, uh, that's gonna become an even greater issue. Water is gonna become an even greater issue. So a lot can put that water where we can't even get it. Uh, even if you just, just hold that water in your hand, did you do anything to get that, put that water there? Nothing. It all came from Allah. Why are we not grateful? All of these, all of these are, are signs, signs of Allah. Signs pointing to Allah. Okay, just think about this. They're, they're, they're signs of Allah. They're ayah, just like ayah of the Quran. So it, just think if, if one person were able to take one of the ayah of the Quran and remove it, what an uproar there would be in the Muslim community all over the world. But in the past 150 years, 22 species of animals have become extinct. 22. 22 whole communities have ceased to exist. And each animal in that community was a sign, was an ayah pointing to its creator. A lot of signs are being removed because we need to be comfortable. <laughs> Allah. And, and, and in the next few decades, one million species of animals and plants face extinction because we need bigger houses and we need water on demand in our car all the time, a bottle of water, you know, bottles of water in the trunk. We need that, right? <laughs> So Allah is telling us, just give us, give us thought to the, the creation of the heavens and the earth. These things weren't created aimlessly, right? Be mindful. We need to see these animals and these plants as the, the whole, all of creation is just a, a display of the divine qualities. Uh, a, a display of the divine names, Allah's divine names in nature. That's what nature is. And thus requiring reverence and dignity and justice. These, these, these animals, these plants in nature, they, they're Muslim like us. Why? Because they prostrate. They prostrate the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the trees, they prostrate and they submit to Allah willingly. They're Muslims. So contemplate all these signs in the Quran so that we can be grateful for them. We can honor them as gifts of Allah. We can use them more mindfully. We can protect them. We'll, by this, we'll be doing justice uh, to our creator by being grateful to our creator. We'll be doing justice to the sign of Allah by honoring it, we'll be doing justice to ourselves by being an appreciative servant. Another way we can contribute to justice to the environment is by being a Khalifa. Like Sara said, Allah has made us Khalifas, not consumers. Say it with me, Khalifas, not consumers. Khalifas, not consumers, right? <laughs> and then know that this, with this, 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 this stewardship, there's responsibility. We're going to be tried by everything that Allah has given us. It's, it's our corruption. It's our failure to maintain the balance. It's our uh, perpetuation of inequality. It's our injustice to ourselves and others. That's what leads to suffering. But we have these signs in the Quran. We have these signs in the Quran that are reminding us to be just, to remember Allah. But we also have the actions and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who taught us how to deal with water, land, plants, animals, how to live in harmony with the environment. And there are, are, are two that are my favorite in 40, 40 Green Hadith. The first one is, and, and, and this one, I just imagine like the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like tugging on his blessed ear and be like, do you not hear? 
Do you not hear? Verily, simple living is part of faith. Simple living is part of faith. And my other favorite one is take up good deeds only as much as you are able. For the best deeds are those done regularly, even if they are few. So this halakha is, is part of a series that deals with the, the issues that have uh, depreciated God's gift of dignity because of a gender-based oppression, racism, poverty. And, and, and there's a relationship between environmental justice and gender and racism and poverty. Uh, environmental injustice, including climate change, it amplified issues of gender and race and poverty. There are, uh, uh, let me just give you an example. So Kharija is a, is a black Muslim woman and she's a convert. She's working at your local supermarket. She gets paid less than the new guy who she is training. And because she lives in a neighborhood that's been redlined because of her state government, she and her family live nearby a, a coal fired energy plant that releases toxins in the air and, and water. And her daughter has asthma, making her susceptible to COVID, even though she's young. Her, her son has a learning disability because of lead in the drinking water. Her son doesn't like going to school because uh, other kids in his class make him feel dumb and call him Abid. And he's likely to end up in the school to prison pipeline. Khadija's husband, she got, he got COVID because he, he's working as a bus, bus driver. He's a, an essential worker, just like Khadija. And so Khadija is, she somehow has to manage uh, working, managing the distance learning for her children, caring for a sick husband and along with the regularly, uh, regular uh, daily demands of her home life. And I, I'm not promoting Khadija as a victim. I'm just illustrating how she experiences the world, how she is viewed and how she is treated. So when we understand these intersectionalities, we can understand how we can work with Khadija to make the world a more balanced, uh, make, the, make the world more balanced and just for her. And this, this is just a snippet of Khadija's life as an example of how environmental destruction robs current Khadija's generation and future generations like her children of, of dignity and many overlapping intersecting spheres. So what's, what's the Muslim's obligation to the environment? Be just, be a part of justice. So we wanna start with the Quran because we Muslims, that's where we start. We, we read the Quran and contemplate the signs of Allah in nature, alhamdulillah. We're gonna start there. And then we get to see nature as our, our fellow Muslims. And then we're going to remember that we are Khalifas, not consumers. And then we're gonna live simply. And we're gonna start with small but consistent deeds. Muslims, stand for justice, even if it be against yourselves or your parents or your relatives, whether you're rich or poor. Justice is just the foundation. That's we're, we're, here's justice right here. We're, we're way somewhere else, right? Justice is the foundation. And from there, inshallah, we can work on ihsan. We can work on excellence, beautifying our character. And it, someone with uh, ihsan, a person with ihsan, they pay, attention, they pay attention to things that other people do not. So for example, the person with ihsan, when we're planning our Eid celebration, they're going to uh, they're kind of considered the, uh, the need to commemorate our holy holidays in a way that doesn't pollute or damage our nature or our neighborhood with like pop plastic balloons and mylar balloons and water bottles and food thrown away. The person with a sand, they're going to pay attention to things that other people don't. 
So justice is the foundation. And then we're gonna work on Ifan, inshallah. So may Allah make us Khalifas of excellence, giving all of creation its dignity and rights. And may Allah count us among those who are grateful and just. Amin. I mean, I mean, uh, Sister Sarah, Sister Corey, I uh, can't ask enough in a sense. Y'all y'all really brought the heat. I wish y'all were down here in Texas in February when we had a uh, winter storm that came up from uh, uh, from Sarah's uh, New Jersey area. So we really, really appreciate that much needed. But alhamdulillah, I, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the chat says it, but also just uh just love the way you both just tie, tied in this concept of dignity and just how holistic it is. I, I want to lift up one thing before we just kind of go into uh, some of the questions here. And y'all, y'all did a, a real service to us as well by having discussion questions because I was looking through them. I was like, I want to ask them some of these questions <laughs> because I think we, we, we would like to hear your perspective on it. But inshallah, uh, just the, the concept of this, uh, this real connection that we've got, this connection that we have from the divine. Uh, one thing we've been covering here at Muslim Space, uh, each morning uh, after Fajr is the 99 names of Allah and how those names connect to us, not only in a sense from the divine, but connect us to everything that's around us. And so, you know, the manifestations, everything around us is, has those divine sparks. You know, in high school, we used to be told yeah. uh, you're made from star stuff. You know, you're made, you have like this stuff, but it's like, you're also made from that, that divine stuff, that those divine sparks mm -hmm. and just seeing that in the environment and how often we, you know, just walk past or like drive past like, you know, some shrubs or some trees or anything like that, or just, and then just, just like, you know, just completely background it and, and not reflect like you did. I appreciate y'all lifting up how these are signs. Um, I think it, it was helpful to have you two speak. And then I think, um, you know, the green fellows really brought the heat in the chat as well. So uh, sister Rianne um, was, was holding it down in the chat, but, you know, mentioning <laughs> that, that beautiful uh, concept that an ayah is also versed in the Quran, but it's a sign, it's a, it's a, it's a divine sign. So really, really love that, alhamdulillah. Uh, but just, uh, just to, we'll go ahead and start us off just to let uh, everyone know uh, in the chat, you can just drop your questions in, um, in, in the chat. And if you would like to, uh, if you'd like to ask your question, you're welcome to do so on mic as well. Just raise your hand and we can call on you. Um, I'll just uh, loft one up here just to get us started. And inshallah, we can, we can go from there. But again, like I said, drawing from the source material. So we're going, we're going to 40 green hadith because I, I really loved, uh, it was, it was a nice concise, but it was just such an informative, uh, such an informative read. And I hope everyone can take advantage of that. But so we talked about, you know, the, the reasoning, you know, we, we've talked about the, the Quran, the Hadith, why it's why it's it's an, it's an obligation. It's like fard, it's a fard kafaya upon us to take care of the environment, to be there as as Khalifas, to be stewards um, and caretakers. Now, talk to me about how we can bring this uh, the environment into our discourse into the when we talk about you know muslims are real big about talking about justice we'll talk about justice day and night we'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll milk that stuff uh back and forth but when it comes to the environment we still have styrofoam plates piling up for for ramadan we've still got all this stuff how do we bring in the environmental justice all this intersection that is going on with the environment i love that example that you brought up sister Corey, of sister khadija just because how harrowing it is how connected things are um you know by by humans creation you know allah creates and everything is connected in allah's creation but humans create as well and how how connected are our bad things to each other in the sense our treatment of the environment to our treatment of other people so i want to ask you how can we bring environmental uh, ethics, justice, and that that real strong concept, that foundation that's in the Quran, that's in the Hadith, to the forefront, um, as opposed to something like, oh, those are just what those like liberal hippies are doing. And they just they just want us to recycle and compost and and all this stuff. How do we bring it to that level of seriousness that all these other issues of justice take, um, especially in this time of Ramadan where you get those emails? It's like, brother, last ten days, make them count. You know, donate to this cause, donate to this cause. But we don't see environment at the forefront. How do we how do we mm -hmm. get that there? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you want to go? I just finished talking a lot. You want to go? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, sure. Great question. And I'll speak on a personal level because I too continuously see this for myself as well. And it is difficult because change is difficult. I think especially when you're comfortable with something. If you're comfortable with having styrofoam plates and styrofoam cups 
and it's just how it's always been. Um, and you don't see an awakening. You don't see a reason why this could be false. It'll be really difficult to be a disruptor to see its change. But I think first and foremost, it's by education and awareness. And um, by introducing into your local masajid, by introducing into your friend circle and your family circle, this notion of creation and care and the need to take care of the environment and use visuals. I love visuals, have a visuals. I know uh, Sister Corey has uh, um, a post on her Instagram. It's like, does your, if, does, um, does the, the does, your, does your iftar last longer than you? Does your iftar last longer than you? Does the utensils that you use or the plate, does that last longer than, you or the food that you're going to eat, right? Um, so I think creating an illustration and also bringing up the idea and bringing up this awareness because it needs to constantly be reminded. Um, I know there's a, there's a campaign called the, the Green Chudba campaign. Um, and it's definitely check, look that up. Um, it's a great resource to use, especially for your imams, for your khatibs to use. And will, it, it will introduce the, the notion of taking care and protecting the environment to the congregation. And this is sometimes, you know, even though it started off as a once a year thing, but include it more in the conversation and discussion. And it's gonna seem a little foreign. We had it at our masjid and even the person that was given the khutbah was was like this is a little strange for me to talk about, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it so that we our should can participate in this campaign. But I would suggest bringing in the conversation and dialogue, have that conversation and have it sternly as well, but also be open minded to it um, and encouraging in, in a way that people will want to feel attached to to this conversation and will want to feel like they can do something to be a part of it whether it's promote the idea of bringing a reusable bottle to the masjid or have your imam carry a reusable bottle, you know, to the masjid, just so it's a visual, right? You're connecting the visual with the, with the notion of taking care of the environment. But um, it, 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 it's an interesting one because oftentimes we don't see environmentalism and the sustainability aspect at the forefront when our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the greatest environmentalist, right? And this is embedded in our religion over 1400 years ago. So I think starting that discussion, introducing those materials into the, the masjids and, and creating that discussion with, start with your home um, and, and your friends and your family and definitely continue it into the masjids to, to have, um, what's the word I wanna use? to have like this sense of urgency for it as well, because unfortunately um, things seem like they're just gonna keep getting worse and worse. So definitely create this urgency and, and encourage your masjids and your family and friend group to continue this conversation and have some action items, inshallah. So how I, how I would say, um, how do we bring this into the conversation? How, would he, how do we make this uh, you know, more important to the average Muslim. We need to get the average Muslim out in nature, spending time in nature, especially right now, people are tired of being inside. So maybe there needs to be this, this masjid program that's let's get families outside together. Let's get children outside together. When people spend time in nature, they're less likely to throw a car tire out there, right? <laughs> And you know, <laughs> spending time, spending time and not just spending time, but spending time with the intention of seeing Allah's signs of nature. So connecting mm -hmm. Islam to nature, that's how we get this, this, this sense of urgency. We, we gotta spend time. Definitely, definitely. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Sure. So sorry. this is this is an important question to ask during Ramadan because this is in Ramadan is a time where we're making new habits, right? We're doing things that we haven't done the rest of the year, right? Some people have just started praying again, alhamdulillah. Some people are coming back to the Quran, alhamdulillah. This is the time. This is the time to make new habits. Whether that habit is using a reusable water bottle, whether that habit habit is making wudu with as little water as possible. Just revive the sunnah of these, 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 these green habits 
these green sustainable habits from the Sunnah, just revive one. During, do that during Ramadan. Just start with one. Absolutely. I would like to add also, um, after Corey mentioned spending time outside. So when we were young, our, our Masjid and Community Center hosted, um, we would have camps um, at the Stoke State Forest, not far from where we live. And we would actually be intense. And this would be every year for maybe two to three days in July. And since I was a small child to now, I still appreciate that time in nature. And I remember when we were younger, we'd literally lay, um, cause where we are right now, it's very difficult to see the stars. But um, at the forest, we would lay down on the floor and just look up and subhanAllah, you'd see so many stars. And yeah, I just wanted to like reiterate the, the notion of, of spending time in nature. And if you have children, let them, you know, take them outside and spend time with them. And, and when you love something or you have a love something love for something, you're, you're going to want to protect it. And that's how I want us to see nature as well. Definitely appreciate you both uh, lifting, lifting those up, um, especially with regards to, uh, to that, that, that concept of visuals um, that, that you, that you mentioned, uh, Sada, I think I just learned something new. I never, I never knew New Jersey had forests. So now there's, there's something in me that says it's not all industry. So I'm glad, I'm glad, glad to hear there's some greenery around there to, to get away from. State. The, the Garden, Garden State, State. New Jersey, all right? <laughs> I know. Sister Corey's got this look on her face too. So I'm glad, I, I hope that's at the same thing I'm at. So <laughs> inshallah, we're in the same boat. But yeah, no, no, no. I, I appreciate y'all lift that up. And uh, it, it, and just, just to kind of go with regards, I think, um, Sister Corey, you mentioned this uh, and in, in kind of uh, combination with, with Sister Sarah, this, this concept of visuals. You know, so when we had this, uh, when we had this uh, weird, you know, winter storm that, that, that came by in, in February, so many Texans, apart from being out of power, were also out of water. And one thing that I had noticed, it, it wasn't before, it, it, was, uh, it was after, you know, we'd kind of gone through this, but I realized that when we had our water shortage, we literally had to go get like a case of water just to, you know, just to be able to do wudu or anything like that. And I realized that when I was reading your, uh, the, the 40 Green Hadith book, it talked about the process of using two thirds of a lead, two thirds liters, uh, like one mud um, of uh, water for ablution. And so when I, I remember when this, this it was before I read this hadith, because after that winter storm, I was like, you know what, I could actually make wudu with about just this water bottle I've got this like, you know, this like 16.9 fluid ounces, 500 milliliter water bottle. And I was just like, it just it, it, it hit me at that moment. I was like, you know, you don't even think about how much I was like, how many water bottles was I using? before because the faucet was just probably on right this is probably streaming and then i was just like you know i don't really need more than this even that like you know, you're able to make it last but it was really impactful to see that um in in y'all in y'all's book and and how it was just like yeah like you know what like whoa like what, what are we what are we kind of doing and the same thing with regards to you know in terms of showers and whatnot and especially you know it's, it's just how 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 cognizant we have uh, forgotten ourselves to be when it's just like, hey, it's a luxury, you know, water will come on. And it's not till you go to other places, you go to nature, you go to other places where, oh, hey, we don't have maybe restrooms, we don't have running water. So you kind of have that awareness. So I appreciate y'all lifting, lifting up the, the lived experience and putting that stuff in conversation. One thing I wanted to ask y'all, in, in a sense, this is more personal for both of y'all. So we, we've talked about the average Muslim as if they're out there. I think I hope all of us are the average Muslim or fit that category here to an extent. But I, wa I want to ask, how did you all come to uh, not just this awareness, but to this work and not just to this work, but to have a faith based component to this work? Uh, you know, Sister Corey from Alabama in the South, you know, I don't know where our, our politicians down here aren't really exactly the greenest. I don't know if you had a recycling bin growing up, but that was something we just got in the last 10 years. Um, and then Sister Sada, you've got, uh, you know, you, you, you've got, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of clouds there that may not be clouds. So they, they might be a lot of other things, but talk to me a little bit. How about y'all kind of uh, came into this work and what, what clicked for you, especially with that faith-based component? I nope. can start. Go I ahead. can start, but Go okay, ahead. okay. <laughs> so I already talked about uh, you know my background uh, growing up with uh, my grandmother in Alabama, and you know there was there was back then wasn't that long ago though. Um, my grandmother used to take you know we used to have sodas, pop, 
in a in a in a glass in a glass uh, container, right? And she, she she would collect those and bring them back and get some money back, right? So and our recycling was uh, giving leftovers to the dogs and the chickens. You know, <laughs> we didn't need a recycling bin because everything got used or you know uh, composted into the garden. But later on, um, I became uh, a mom with all the accoutrements of children that children bring. And um, we would go to the masjid as a family. And uh, one time we were, we were there and we're waiting for the adhan. And there's this uh, table, you know, that's set with uh, uh, styrofoam cups full of bananas and bananas and dates. And there's this one Ramadan where Allah just flipped that light bulb. And I saw people pick up the, the cup and eat the fruit and throw it away. So they, they picked up the cup, they ate the fruit and throw it away. So that's like, I don't know, one minute max. And styrofoam lasts longer than people. It really does. And that's when I was like, I, I can't do this. Ramadan and this mindlessness does not go together. Ramadan is when we're more mindful. We're mindful by, okay, oh, wait a minute. Is it time to pray yet? Not yet? Okay, I'll wait. So we're mindful of everything right, that we're doing, right? And this mindless, uh, this mindless event, it, it was just too much for me. So I started with myself. I started changing myself and my family's habits. I started doing this weird thing. I was the sister with five kids who would come with two bags, one for my clean stuff, one for my dirty stuff of all of our iftar stuff. I would bring a plate and a, a cutlery and a cup and a cloth napkin for myself and my family. Whenever we would go to iftar, that's where I started. I started with my family and it, it it looked weird. People were giving me weird looks, but people were also asking me, what's going on? Why are you doing that? And then we started having these conversations. And then I, I saw later, you know, other people bringing, it could be just a, a, a Tupperware container and a fork. It could be a, a, a plastic plate, um, a plastic plate that were used over and over again and like a metal fork that they got from home. That's fine. And you know, and it's actually, it actually saved me. Uh, there was one time when the sister side temporarily ran out of styrofoam plates, but I had my own plate, so I didn't have to wait <laughs> for them to go to the back and get some more styrofoam plates. I just like, okay, mashallah, I can eat now. All right, I'm done. I'm done, Sarah. Go ahead, your turn. <laughs> That's an incredible story. It really is. Um, and and. Sister Corey shows us, don't be afraid to be a disruptor or don't be afraid to be the person that causes that positive change because you never know who you can, who can um, inspire. For me, I, there wasn't like this, this one aha moment. I think it was a culmination of years of spending time in nature. <laughs> Good trouble, exactly. I think it's just a culmination of, of having that connection with nature. Um, because I'm a part of that generation where it's a little bit right before technology and social media became apparent, where we spent most of our times, um, I grew up in the suburbs, most of our time was spent playing in the backyard and, and dial up, dial up was, still, was still a thing. So we stayed in the backyard till it, get, till it got dark uh, and my mom would call us back in. So I spent a lot of time with my siblings just being outdoors. We had this pine tree in the backyard and just rocks and we would just play. We would just play outside, enjoy being outside, ride our bikes, spend time outside. And as I got older, I realized, um, sorry, like the sun is, okay. As I got older, I realized that when things, when, when life got a little difficult or when things were, um, you know, weren't going the way I wanted to, or whenever I felt sad, I found this, beautiful reassurance and tranquility by spending time in nature. And, and I had, hadn't put the, the two facets of nature and being a Muslim together until I got a lot older. And I realized that 
these aren't two separate entities. Rather, these, rather these are two entities that are intertwined. And there's a reason we feel this this calmness when we listen to a waterfall or 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 this um this tranquility or being in awe when we can gaze underneath stars. Because as Corey reiterates and mentions, these are signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and we are within His creation. So for me, it was it was just that feeling of tranquility that I, I feel to this day, alhamdulillah, of sitting outside, spending time in nature, looking at the trees swaying, listening to the birds chirping as they do their dhikr, you know, during sunset and sunrise. Um, and then a second part of that is seeing uh, the lifestyle of my immigrant parents and, and our um, and just the generation before how they were sustainable before this term kind of even came about and, and growing up and seeing them, you know, repurpose the Tostitos dip into there's pepper sauce in it. Or if you come to the fridge when you were growing up and you tried to, you open a can, it's probably not what you, you know, thought it would be. There's pancake mix in the cashew box, you know? So just the repurpose um, and reusing of a lot of the items as well as uh, my aunt, when I went over her house a few years ago, she would tell me that growing up um, in Guyana, that they would use the um, sort of the leftover residue of the fireplace and you use that, you collect that and you put it in the garden, but you also use it to wash plates. So just hearing those stories just allowed me to feel a part of um, an ancestry and lineage from a long time ago of people who were able to live without causing harm and a lot of destruction to their surrounding environments. Yeah, thank you all both for, for sharing that. It's, um, you know, it's really powerful to hear just, just how the environment around you, not, not a play on words, but the environment around you helped create some of that awareness, you know, in, 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 in the sense that uh, these were just, just kind of habits, like, you know, just, just on. And it was just like, wait, this makes sense. Like, why, why aren't we doing this? And, 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 you know, Islam just kind of having that foundation and, and, and playing in and later on, but the, the fact that, Hey, we, we used to just, you know, when we would finish with, with these bottles or we'd finish with this stuff, we would find something else to do with it. That wasn't the end of the story. And I really appreciate how y'all lift up that, uh, you know, these materials outlast us oftentimes. And, you know, why, why, why is it that they only last maybe for us, like, you know, within, within a day span or, Hey, this is, this is out or this can is out and just toss it out. I, I appreciate y'all. Y'all lifted that up. Um, what, one thing I definitely want to uh, ask here is I, I got a question that, that just came in. Let me just take a look here. So a uh, question that came in said that you shared with us with, with us some great ways to get started on becoming more green in our personal lives. Unfortunately, um, we are very little in the very in the fish of uh, or we're very little fish in the huge ocean of pollution and waste. We can hardly compete with others all over the world, let alone huge corporations, the fossil fuel industry, and governments who are intentionally inactive uh, in modifying their ways. What are some ways we little fish can put pressure on the big fish to change? So some of us uh, little fish got to get together in schools and make some change in our local environments, right? In our, in our local governments. But that's, that's part of it too. That's part of it too. And, and that's very important. So for example, in, um, in Maryland where I live right now, uh, there is the Anacostia Watershed Society. And they set up uh, traps on different streams that collect collects the trash that are coming out um, into uh, the local rivers, right? And so they they would keep data uh, and collecting how many how how much trash they find, what types of trash they find, and they use these things to um, work with the govern government to create laws that would later come to uh, banning paper bags or uh, banning uh, straws or uh, banning styrofoam in businesses. Um, uh, so there are these bans in our area right now. So whenever we go to a restaurant um, in DC, they're, you're not, they're not allowed to give out uh, paper straws, uh, plastic straws. They can use, we have to use uh, uh, paper straws now. And in, uh, in Maryland, uh, styrofoam, is no longer allowed. So there is, uh, there 
are people who are very good and it's necessary these people who are good at advocacy and uh, local and state governments that is definitely a part uh, a part of the um, of the solution but I want to say that um, you know sometimes we we feel like small fish um, but as Muslims we are the ones that believe that uh, Allah is the, the, the controller of everything. And I, I like to liken this to, to, to archery. So uh, uh, as, a, as an archer, I have my bow and I have, um, I have my arrows and I can, I can aim and I can let go. Who's, con who's in control of the arrow? Not me, just take your aim. And we know that Allah is, is in control of the, of the seen and the unseen. So whereas a few years ago, no one would have thought that styrofoam would have been banned in Maryland. No one would have thought that uh, in DC, you could no longer get a plastic straw, but it's here now. It's here now, Alhamdulillah. Thanks to some people who've done some great advocacy work. Sarah? Absolutely. Um, those are really great examples. I would say uh, consume responsibly. Um, be aware of if you're if you're gonna purchase something. Be aware of of um, the consumption of that. And be aware of how it was made. And you want to support organizations that are working towards bettering the environment. And sometimes that could be a little bit more expensive, but inshallah, with uh, in the long run, it'll be worth it. And also noting um, sort of echoing sentiments of what Sister Corey was mentioning is that our religion is, is one of intention and one of effort as well. So inshallah, we, put, we um, make the right intention to, to better the environment and we do those conscious, even if they're small, small efforts, Allah sees everything that we do um, and it's better than not doing anything. And I read somewhere also on a separate note in terms of the corporations, because it is frustrating sometimes to feel like what difference do I make if, if a lot of the um, destruction and devastation is coming from larger corporations? And I read somewhere that one of the major, um, I think, gas companies had, who contributes a lot to pollution, had actually um, released or, or, or made it um, known of the like individual carbon footprint, you know, to sort of distract or, or deter from the work that they're doing, but hold companies accountable and support those that, um, after doing research, I would say do research also, but support those that are trying to make an effort or are making an effort to do better. But also remind yourself that um, from an individual perspective, what can I do to help the environment too? Because it can be overwhelming to, to just see all these big corporations that we might not be able to um, have an impact with. But I think it's just important to start with yourself and start with what can you do, um, small, consistent, good deed that you can do um, to get the reward and, and to help the environment, inshallah. Definitely appreciate that. And appreciate that that concept of, you know, e even the fish are in a school. We just got to sometimes find that school, but also we, we, we've got to find where we are. You know, we, it, it, it really does start with ourselves and, you know, connecting to, to what y'all had said uh, previously in terms of the utility of these things, the utility of even those things, which we'd be like, hey, this is old or whatever it might be. Uh, and connecting that with the prophetic, it just brings to mind the the example of the Prophet when, when Aisha anha would, would say that, you know, he would he'd be someone who would mend his clothes, you know, so the clothes get tattered, um, you know, people would bring him different, like, you know, luxurious cloths and different rugs and things like that. And, you know, obviously uh, had, had that respect and people would, you know, bend over backwards to make sure that at least the Prophet is, is, is uh, you know, dressed properly, but someone who makes reuse of that uh, and, and applying that, that, that there, I, I just really love that, uh, you know, how you all lift that, that lifted that up uh, in terms of just things that we use here, um, but even with our clothes, even with just those basic, really basic things. Um, so I want to be mindful of our time. One question I did get in here, I think that this might be um, a, a good point uh, to, to pause the conversation on. We're not, we're not stopping the conversation, of course, it's going to continue, but pausing the conversation on uh, is talking about uh, 
practical resources, especially within the Muslim community. Um, so I know, uh, I think it was in, in your bio, Sister Corey, that you know you serve as co-chair of the, uh, uh, the, the Green Team um, at uh, Masjid Muhammad, uh, the nation's mosque. So uh, just talking to us, both of y'all, um, with regards to uh, some practical resources within the Muslim community uh, that, that, that are there for not just Masajid, but also for the individual um, looking to get connected, looking to get informed uh, about, you know, Islam and environmental ethics and things like that. But uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll turn it over to you all for just uh, whatever you'd like to, to add to, to that, that you already have it to put in there. Thank you. So, so really, really quickly, I think that um, this is, this is not just, okay. What I learned from being in a green faith is, there are other people, there are other uh, faith traditions that are working on this too. And we, we, can, we need to work together. So one of the resources that I think are probably, probably pretty much available in uh, a, a lot of states is Interfaith Power and Light. So Interfaith Power and Light, uh, they have branches in, 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 different, in different states, but working with uh, Interfaith Power and Light and in other interfaith sources, because um, you may not find uh, Muslim sources or whatever in your community, but you can work with other people of faith and uh, share information because we got one planet, so we, we, we all have work to do together and we should be doing this together. Um, another good point, give me one second. Okay, another good point is to um, educate yourself. I think a great book to read is Green Dean uh, by Ibrahim abdul -Mateen. And then also there's a lot of social media accounts, especially on Instagram, which is a wonderful surprise, um, alhamdulillah, where uh, there's a lot of Muslim, especially Muslim environmental accounts as well. Um, so if you follow myself or Sister Corey, we will gladly um, put you in contact with any of these um, organizations that we both uh, support and uplift as well, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Well, uh, thank you all so much. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair. It's, it's been a true pleasure and it's really been uh, kind of eye-opening because it's not, you know, oftentimes our society conditions us to be like, here's the environmental aspects, here's the environmental activists, um, here's the social justice activists, here's everybody else for there. But just showing how connected this is how connected we are. And you know, when we think about it, yeah, you know, and we're in the environment, literally, like whether we're in our homes or anywhere, we're always in the environment. We never leave the environment. Even if we go to outer space, we're still in, <laughs> we're still in an environment. Uh, so I really appreciate y'all lifting up the connectivity um, to both the, the, the environment that's around us, but also to how it's intersected with so many of the issues that we have, especially those issues that are so prominent in, 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 in our Muslim Community's discourse, and I appreciate Sister Corey lifting up that it, it, it's it's uh it's it's not uh, it's not a solo project. You know, you definitely the work starts at home, but uh you know it's it's not an excuse that if someone if there's not a Muslim you know mosque, there's oh my mosque doesn't have a green team or whatnot. I guess I'm not gonna you know do these things. That there's always other organizations and other people of faith and other areas that we can really reach out to. So I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. So please give uh, these awesome ladies a follow on Instagram. So I don't know if Corey prefers to go by Corey or at Green Ramadan. I have a habit of calling people by their Instagram name. So um, I will shout out both of those. So at Green Ramadan, at Sarah Latif, please do, do follow. Uh, them and just take a look at the amazing work that uh, that these two ladies are doing and um, yeah that and check out that that book um, Green Dean it's it's amazing so uh, yeah with that like I said we uh, will go ahead and conclude but that wraps up our Ramadan Halakha series uh, as I've been talking to Shadia inshallah this is just a pause on the series but we will definitely and have seen the need to continue it to have these conversations not just a one-off not just Ramadan hey we're mindful and we're feeling active but the, keep that conversation going Ramadan is about transformation and keeping that uh, that transformation that change going so inshallah keep an eye out for uh, a lot of these topics to come in the in the future but uh, just a quick plug on Ramadan uh, as we are entering in these last uh, few days uh, Muslim space is planning for a uh, in-person uh, distanced and COVID safe uh, outdoor Eid uh, gathering. Um, so do do check uh, the Muslim space website for that and then lastly uh, each morning we do have uh, the 
99 names of the lost session. So reflecting on this, so I will surely take what Sister Sada and Sister Corey have dropped these gems and uh, try and incorporate what I can with the with the final few names that we have, because each of these names keep pointing us back, keep pointing us back. And I really appreciate you guys coming out, but Jazak Khair, and like I said, we're, part, we're putting a pause on our conversation. I have y'all's emails, so don't think you're off the hook with Muslim space yet. We'll definitely be in touch for a, a future conversation, inshallah. Inshallah. So, Thank uh, you so much for having us. Yeah, no, no problem. Zakla guys. So